Here we go! Welcome to the Nintendo Power Zone. We are a video cast slash podcast dedicated to bringing you the best Nintendo related topics. As always, I am your host, Nice One, and joining me today is my co host, Blues. Welcome back, man. How's it been going? It's been going good, going good. A lot of Mario Party in my life recently. Oh, man, I'm so jealous. I haven't got Mario Party yet. I have been busy with other games. Um, we're going to talk about that later in today's show because we are bringing back what are we playing. But in all honesty, it's been a, it's been a couple of slow news weeks uh, thus far, but we do actually have a good number of news topics to go over today. Uh, so we've been off the air for about three weeks. Uh, just just needed to get back into the swing of things. So, you know, I needed to just take a little bit of an extra week off. Uh, but I'm back, and so is Blues, and next time Jana will be here. But for right now, we're going to go ahead and slide into the Powered Up news because there are a lot of big stories to cover. Uh, so first up, Dragalia Loss made $3 million in five days, making it the lowest grossing Nintendo mobile game in its first five days. Uh, under any other circumstances, I think this would be a big win, but this is a Nintendo title. So in my opinion, everybody scrutinizes what Nintendo does a lot more than they would scrutinize, you know, a an independent, you know, mobile game developer. It's it's weird too because Psy Games has a lot of the the Japanese audience. And I was talking to Mario after party about this recently and he 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 gave me the thought process that maybe Dragalia Lost is a little bit too Eastern for most Western audiences, and that's why it didn't really take here like it took off in Japan. Uh, just to put things in perspective, uh, the numbers uh, for Nintendo's more popular mobile titles go as follows. So uh, Fire Emblem Heroes made $13 million in its first five days. Super Mario Run made $8.3 million in its first uh, five days. Uh, Animal Crossing, uh, what is it called? Pocket Camp made four point six million in its first five days, and that leaves Dragalia lost at three point million. It is. We should note that Mitomo was not listed here on this list, but out of all of those mobile apps, it is the only one that isn't a game. Um, any thoughts on this? What, are you, what What is your thought process? Why do you think that Dragalia lost isn't taking off the way that games like Fire Emblem? and Super Mario Run, and even Animal Crossing did. Um, well, first of all, I think Dragalia Lost is a new IP. There is not really an established fan base yet. So you look at Animal Crossing, Animal Crossing fans are everywhere, and they love Animal Crossing. You look at Pokemon, Pokemon fans, <laughs> the entire c country of Japan loves Pokemon. Of course it's going to sell. Uh, Mario, everyone knows loves Mario. So it's like three of their biggest Fire Emblem was like, what, one of the top grossing if not the top grossing 3ds series and so you're coming into these sort of you're adding an open space for established franchises to sort of go into but when you have an established like a new thing that has no established fan base or expectations or anything uh you really end up i guess the word i might think of is you don't have anything to really work with. You're starting from the ground up. Yeah, you have what Psy Games and they're set kind of established, and you have Nintendo and they're kind of established. But I feel like it, at least in in the West here, um, we also didn't get it presented too well. Um, I kind of like it flew under my radar. Like I stayed in, like I watched the whole Dragalia Lost direct, and yet it still flew under my radar for the most part. Like. I didn't know it came out until you told me that it did, and I still actually haven't played it, <laughs> just because I, it's not been on my radar, and I think that's a big not part of it. It wasn't presented or put in, in front of us, like how Breath of the Wild was put in front of us, or Odyssey was put in front of us. Yeah, uh, not for nothing, I have yet to play Dragalia Lost uh, myself. It is something on my to-do list. I've actually been really busy playing other games, mostly on my Switch, um, and so it's you're just been left... You're actually uh, playing this again? Yes, I actually beat Spider-Man three times. Three? I'm still yet to beat it once. I'm still kind of in the beginning yet, actually. I've... Uh, yeah, I beat it uh, once 
for uh, I, I beat it once just for my own pleasure. I beat it a second time uh, to do some uh, live reactions to to what was happening in the game on my other YouTube channel, and then I beat the game a third time just to uh, capture some B-roll footage so that I can do an analysis video on the game um, that I hope to have out by the end of the month. That being said, though, yeah, I'm, I'm playing my Switch a lot more. A uh, bunch of games came out, and I got a bunch of games for my birthday. Uh, my birthday week la was last week. It was crap. The only good thing was that all the people who love me bought me video games. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I was able to get a, a you know, a nice little stack of uh, titles for my Switch, and I've mm -hmm. been enjoying them thoroughly. Um, so Dragalia Lost hasn't been on my radar uh, in the sense that it's just it's getting obscured by too many other games, and I think that's the problem. When we look at when uh, these games had come out initially, I think uh, as a Nintendo fan, uh, the only game that really got lost in any kind of shuffle is Animal Crossing because Animal Crossing came out in 2017, and as we all know, in 2017, there was a game every month following the launch of the Nintendo Switch. When Super Mario Run was launched, there were no Nintendo games on the Wii U, really. Uh, so the only way you were going to get to play a Nintendo game was on <laughs> was on your mobile device if and if you didn't own a Wii U. And Fire Emblem came out in February of last year? I believe yeah. so, yes. Which is Which, just before the Switch. Mm-hmm. So th those first five-day revenues, I think, are, 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 are skewed in the sense that there were no core Nintendo titles to play. Uh, and there were no third-party releases on a Nintendo console that people were rushing to the store to get. And for the first time in a long time, we have that. So the mobile games don't seem that enticing. Another thing is, and you brought the first point up, that Dragalia lost his new IP. But thus far, Nintendo has used its new IP or its mobile IP to kind of promote what's happening in their core consoles. Like they're, they're like mm -hmm. a gateway drug. And Dragalia lost launching on mobile and having no console counterpart might hinder its ability to sell. Uh, here in the West, in Japan, it's doing pretty good though. I'm not, like that's you know three million dollars is not a small amount of money. It just seems small in comparison to you know Fire Emblem, which is beating it by ten million in its first five days. I think this is a pretty cool story. I am gonna play Dragalia Lost this weekend, uh, and then I definitely want to come back and revisit this topic. Uh, but while we're on the topic, I mean, of Dragalia Lost, well, let's see if. If I released a new mobile game and I made three million in my first five days, I would not be complaining. Oh, you, Nintendo's definitely not complaining. <laughs> They're definitely not complaining. Uh, but you know, while we're talking about Dragalia Lost, uh, there are going to be some updates uh, to the game, and that includes uh, characters from Grand Blue Fantasy are going to be crossing into Dragalia Lost. And I, I kind of wish Jaden had been able to make this episode because mm -hmm. he's, he's a big Grand Blue fan. Huge fan of Grand Blue Fantasy. How does he and afford I, all the gotchas? Huh? How does he afford all the gotchas, do you think? I, I don't know, man. I think Jaden <laughs> like I think Jaden runs the black market in California or something or something. <laughs> like like I spend a lot of money, but you know Jaden Jaden be spending money as like, how do you get that money? <laughs> anyway. Alright, moving on. Grand Blue Fantasy yeah. characters are joining uh the Dragalia Lost. And that's that's pretty big. I mean, that's a really big way. Especially it's a good crossover. It's a strong it's crossover. It's a better crossover for the Japanese audience. We do yeah. not have Grand Blue Fantasy here in the States unless you're messing around with, you know, APKs and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but in Japan, that's a huge crossover because that game is huge. That game is like eight years old. It's still the number one mobile game in Japan. And Grand Blue Fantasy crossing over to Gilead Lost. That's gonna draw a lot of those Grand Blue Fantasy fans into. That's kind of hard to say. Grand Blue Isn't Fantasy. Is it the fans. same developer too? Is Psy it Psy Games, Games yeah. made um, Grand Blue and Dragalia? Yeah. Yeah. So that that like that crossover is really good. I would. I don't even know if we're gonna get that crossover here in the states. They didn't explicitly say. I don't see why they wouldn't. It just seems like the context would be lost on on the Western audience, in my opinion. Yeah, it probably would. All right. Uh, they did announce in the same uh, uh, interview that 
Nintendo co-wrote the game with them. Uh, they didn't specifically state which writers uh, who work for Nintendo helped them write this game. Um, but that's interesting to know that there. Were, I initially had assumed that uh, side games had pretty much made the game, and Nintendo saw it, liked it, and said, we'll buy that off of you. Because, you know, up until that point, Nintendo had just been working with DNA. And now I know DNA does own side games, or 25% of side games. I didn't... I just thought they had seen what they had done and then just, hey, we'll buy that. We want that as a new IP. No, Nintendo was, you know, pretty active in the development of this game. Uh, and they're actively looking to try to get an anime adaptation of the video game. Ooh, okay. So that's pretty cool. I mean, that would definitely be a way to, like, boost uh, interest in a mobile game. It's, it's, like, it's like the whole Pokemon effect where, you know, you release something on, on a certain console and then you release an anime to coincide with that. And then you watch as the bank, you know, just starts to pile up, you know? Yeah, Level 5 is really good at that. With Yokai Watch, um, Layton, they, like, they dominate the anime, like, to animate the game space. And then really all that's in between, like, with our mobile stuff, too. Yeah. No, and, like, it's a really good idea. Uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 isn't Who makes Puzzles and Dragons? Don't they have an anime as well? I think that's also Level 5, I want to say. Gung Ho Gung -ho. Online, actually. Hmm. Yeah. I swear they have an anime. I could be wrong. No, they I, definitely I, have an anime. All uh, right. If not, I mean, they use a lot of, like, anime to promote that game. But still, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it would be it, it would be in Lost's best interest and Nintendo's best interest to explore their IP in, in new and innovative ways. I'm still kind of mm -hmm. upset that we don't have, like, an official, like, Splatoon anime. Now we do have Splatoon manga, and we have like the Splatoon motion comic book that's exclusive to like Japanese YouTube. But we don't have like a Splatoon, you know, anime or or a Mario anime. And I just think maybe well, Dragalia Lost is a better fit for for that genre. But I still think that Nintendo needs to open themselves up to exploring the possibilities of more adaptations of their IP. I mean, we're getting a Mario movie and an ARMS comic. That I'm happy. But I think if you're going to do, like, an anime in any Nintendo franchise, Super Smash Bros. the anime. Hands down. I that, think that's, that's a licensing every, nightmare. It, it totally is. Unless you... Well, you could just stick with just Nintendo characters for that. But, like... I don't know. But Smash Bros. anime is definitely just the ultimate anime. <laughs> There's... <laughs> You can't top that. Yeah, you can make an anime about Mario and Luigi saving the princess, but, you know, that gets old after a couple episodes. Smash Brothers is infinitely, like, to see all those characters coming around in an anime together, That's that's got to be something. It's true. Oh, um, man. But moving on, I believe we have, what, the Toys R Us is, is coming back? Did, did I read Supposedly. that right? Supposedly. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So after five months of being gone from our lives, and trust me, I have actively felt these five months very severely. I was a go to Toys R Us once a week person, and now I go to the places that I used to go to, and I drive past empty buildings, and I just I feel empty on the inside. Although, although I will say this, I do not like this news. I do not like this news. So. The other day, uh, so last week, Toys R Us announced that they were going to be relaunching. Uh, they will no longer be using the Toys R Us name. They were going to be called Jeffrey's Toy Box. Um, that's not, I don't, it's not that I hate the name. It's, let, let's go ahead and uh, give me actually one second. All right. I want to pull up the press release. Thought I had it here. Okay. I'm sorry about the. Drama here. Had to pull up that. I thought I had it in the show notes, but I did not. So, Toys R Us officially announced that they're going to be coming back under the new brand name, mm -hmm. Jeffrey's Toy House. And the press release reads as follows. Uh, this was released on October 2nd, 2018. Jeffrey LLC, Toys R Us, Inc.'s intellectual property holding company subsidiary announced today that it is moving forward with a plan for substantially all of its assets to be acquired by a group of investors led by Jeffrey LLC's existing secured lenders. The announcement was made following a five-month marketing effort by Boston-based Consensus and Investment Bank retained to, market the retained to market the assets of Jeffrey LLC 
That resulted in several formal and informal proposals to acquire the intellectual property assets. After considering such proposals, it was determined that proposal from the existing term lenders was meaningfully higher and better than any other global bid for the sum of the bids received on individual assets. The transition of the business to new, its new owners is pending approval of the United States Bankruptcy Court and all major credit creditor constituencies are supported. Supportive. Jeffrey LLC thanks all parties participated in discussions with the companies over the prior months, particularly those that submitted proposals for their thoughtful and diligent engagement. So essentially what this means is, is that the people who bankrupted Toys R Us bought Toys R Us basically in name only. They didn't buy any of the physical retail locations. They didn't uh, retain any of the former staff that worked at Toys R Us. And a lot of those people were actually pretty good friends of mine. I used, you know, I made friends with the employees at Toys R Us. And so the, the people who bankrupt the company bought the rights to the, the name of the company. And they've relaunched the Toys R Us website and they're going to relaunch, they're gonna open up new stores. Most likely they're gonna buy, you know, back the leases to the old stores and they're gonna rebrand them under the new name. Mm -hmm. Now, unfortunately, they have taken a lot, there's been a lot of backlash for this because a lot of the employees who were let go didn't receive any uh, real kind of severance package. And they, you know, I don't know if they've been out of job for five months. I'd like to assume that most of those people have moved on and found employment elsewhere. But there has been a large public backlash to this. And the thing that bothers me, despite the public backlash, is the fact that the people who bankrupted Toys R Us are going to be the people in charge of the new Toys R Us, which, I mean, that makes very little sense in my mind. It's like, you guys spent eight years bankrupting a company and you let it, you let it completely crash. You guys definitely do not have, you know, the, you know, you don't have the company's best interest at heart. You guys are greedy corporate mongers who want to alienate consumers and make every last dime you can I, I don't know personally like i'm not a huge fan of this announcement actually and i loved toys R Us. You, you can attest you've been on this show for over a year now you can attest that i love shopping at toys R Us. i was very devastated to find out that the company had gone bankrupt and now to see to see it come back as something else but nothing different that's that's damning. I don't know if I will want to shop at Jeffrey's yeah. Toy Box uh, because how long can they stay in business? And this is all on the heels of KB Toys is supposed to be coming back this holiday season as well. So now there is a new toy competitor in the market that will be launching at right around the same time since they both want to launch holiday of 2018. I mean, the whole point was to stave off Amazon and Walmart, they, like that's the whole point of them buying the company as they want to try new methods to try to push Amazon and Walmart out of the toy industry. Uh, but we, we saw how that happened. Amazon and Walmart killed them in the first place. It yeah. killed them in the first place. So how this all unfolds going forward, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, but like I said, I, I'm not happy about this news. I kind of wish that a, you know, a private equity you know company had – bought the name and the rights and tried to relaunch it with new management. Unfortunately, that's not what's going to happen mm -hmm. uh, with this iteration of Toys R Us officially going to be known as Jeffrey's Toy Box. And that's kind of a horrible name, by the way. Yeah. Je mm -hmm. Jeffrey's Toy Box. It doesn't roll off the tongue the way that Toys R Us is. Toys oh. R Us just has a nice flow to it. Jeffrey's Toy Box sounds convoluted and like – you're significantly younger than me. Did you know Jeffrey was a mascot of Toys R Us? Yeah, George uh, Jeffrey the giraffe. Yeah, I just didn't know how like what the marketing campaign was like. I you know I don't really watch a whole lot of like children's television, so I don't know how they marketed Toys R Us. I mean, uh, pretty much after 1995, I have no idea. I don't idea really remember much of the marketing, but I do remember uh, Jeffrey the giraffe for sure. Um, he he like was in a tweet he was in like their last tweet as a store i mean i've already talked about this as as um on the show too but like they tweeted a picture of like jeffrey the giraffe and his suitcase in the last store but i mean i think you've summed it up pretty nicely um in terms of the 
just your thoughts all the same. Like the public hate it. The former employees hate it. You're losing the nostalgia market. It's entirely corporate greed. Um, and it's not really secure thing. You know, we might see them go bankrupt in a couple of years again with well, th- th- nothing's changed. Amazon, Walmart still are there. Uh, Jeffrey LLC, whatever is still owning, et cetera. They're still driving to the ground. Well, the thing, and then, like, I don't even know if I like their new business strategy because, like, they're announcing that there could be mini Toys R Us pop up shops. Uh, we have those here in Tampa. Yeah. We had a uh, st- like mall Toys R Uses, which yeah. were Toys R Us like, Express. We have Express. them here too. Yeah, they were terrible. They were terrible. No, and I don't know if anybody really actually realized this, but Toys R Us Express actually sold the toys, the same toy, at a slightly higher price. Yeah, they're more they expensive. Have- because they had to pay for that mall space yeah. and mall spaces. Mall more prices. Expensive than, it's more expensive than having to have your own retail location. This like, is completely like the opposite of what happened with Best Buy. Like Best Buy, like is a company that's constantly in flux. But whereas you see, where you see Best Buy like taking the necessary steps to, you know, build the company in in a better way. Like they they actually shrank the company to to build it. Like Best Buy closed a bunch of stores. Especially the bigger ones, you know, like there used to be big Best Buys and small mm-hmm. Best Buys. A yeah. lot of the bigger Best Buys are gone in mm-hmm. favor of the smaller Best Buys. They've removed certain items from their you know, their shelves. Like you're not gonna find like CD players, like traditional CD mm-hmm. players. You really can't even find you know newer CDs. They they carry a few vinyls though. Mm-hmm. But you see that their inventory is smaller, and the 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 staff is is more knowledgeable now. Like they've the Best Buy has completely changed like how they do business, and you see, you didn't see that with Toys R Us. You saw Toys R Us pretty much stay the same from like mm-hmm. 1988 all the way to 2018, and that is a long time for a company business model to not change. So, it is what it is. Like I said, I'm not really, I'm not a fan of this comeback. I don't think the people who crashed the company should be allowed to relaunch the company. On the note of Toys R Us. Toys R Us Express really fast. Like those are honestly just a disgrace. You walk into a real Toys R Us, you, everything is cool, everything's fun. You're in a, you're in a wonderland of toys and cool kid stuff, and you're a kid at heart. You walk into Toys R Us Express, it's just it's got a couple cool things here and there. The shelves are aligned to just barely with some things you don't really care about unless you're really, really, really young. Like I don't know, and it's all expensive, and it's like, well, why would I want this? <laughs> I don't know. So it was yeah. not, it was not the same experience at all. Well, I mean, it is what it is. We'll see how this 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 goes down. Like, they didn't specifically say when they're they're gonna relaunch, but they all they basically said was that holiday season twenty eighteen. Uh, yeah. So we'll find out. We'll find out what this uh, how this goes down. I'm not a huge fan of it though. Mm-mm. All right. So moving on. Since we're gonna go from one retailer to another. Nintendo is no longer supplying Amazon France with any more stock. And this comes on the heels of possibly a disagreement between the two companies. And it's kind of a huge one. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the the whole point is, is this. Amazon was selling the Nintendo Switch for 270 euros. Mm-hmm. Which the the value price of the Nintendo Switch in in Europe is two hundred ninety nine ninety nine euro, uh, you know, which is expensive, but I mean everything is a little bit more expensive when we're talking about euro. But Amazon was undercutting the price of of the uh, <laughs> of the Nintendo Switch, and this reminded me of a story I read when I was reading the book Console Wars. Console Wars, there's a little story, uh, there's an anecdote where a retailer had dropped the initial price of the NES console, and another retailer snitched on the first retailer, and then Nintendo stopped sending shipments to the retailer with the discount. This is shades of that little anecdote, uh, and it's because Nintendo really doesn't like letting other companies distribute their products. Nintendo, if they could, would love to be in control of direct distribution. That's not how the video game industry works. Uh, it worked like that in 1983 when Nintendo like had a stronghold 
on the industry. They no longer have that stronghold, but Nintendo's mentality hasn't changed. Nintendo is actually a Nintendo of America, very specifically, is a very ruthless company, and even more so Japan. Uh, they like to play the role of happy-go-lucky toy company, but they can be pretty vicious. And this is one of those things. So now Amazon uh, France has been having to they they've had to remove all pre-orders from their system because they're not getting any games and they're not getting any consoles. Uh, they do have listings for the products, but all that does is take them to third-party sellers. So, like, the, whatever the, the UK version of or the France version of GameStop is, if they have an Amazon listing for a Nintendo Switch console and you see it, you're just getting redirected to that third-party seller. It's a pretty crazy story. I actually cannot believe that in 2018, Nintendo can still stronger, you know, stronger arm companies like this, uh, especially when they are not the number one console seller. I mean, I just think Nintendo is shooting themselves in the foot. If you're going to be, I'm going to be completely honest. It's, I understand what they're doing, but you know, you Nintendo, you can't sell units without the help of Amazon. Amazon is one of the most modern and important resources to buying anything in, in this era. It's... If you don't have Amazon support, you can't make money. <laughs> and when you're, I mean, they'll obviously make money, but it's, they lose a lot of profits as well as these canceled pre orders that they have just won't make consumers happy. And it's not Amazon's fault, it's Nintendo's fault. They're not going to be mad at Amazon. Some of them might be, but they'll be mad at Nintendo. They're going to say, well, I don't want this game anyways, or if I want it, I'll get it from Germany or England or whatever. And it, I just really feel like they're shooting themselves in the foot. I just, I just, you can't sell this game. You're going to get people mad at you. And it's just creating a whole lot of pointless problems. Well, this isn't the first time Amazon France has had controversies. Amazon France is in trouble all the time. Like legit all the time. Amazon France is not like Amazon of America. I don't even. Like they they do a lot of shady stuff at Amazon France, and like they've been hit with a lot of like government sanctions. Um, so I'm actually not surprised to see like you know companies pull out, but not for a reason like this. Mm -hmm. Like it, this is more that Nintendo is unsatisfied with, with the way them that undercutting Amazon the price. Is. Exactly. Like exactly. I understand a lot of the other Amazon France issues, but just the simple you know making it cheaper is not something to really like it's for nintendo that's something to be upset about but in terms of all the rest of their problems that's that's nothing yeah uh let's see so yeah among the games to be removed from the site were super mario party and super smash bros ultimate hopefully mm -hmm. for amazon france's sake they can get this resolved uh before these major games uh you know, come to market. It would be a shame for Amazon France to not be a, a distributor for for uh, Super Smash Brothers and even you know Pokemon Let's Go. These are the, like we're we're getting to the point where like the big games of the year are coming out, and I don't think Amazon France wants to not have Nintendo on their side. Mm -hmm. Holiday season, you want everyone on your side for holiday season. But I mean, once again, I feel like Nintendo's hurting themselves by not having Amazon as a seller. During that holiday season, they're not going to get as many sales for their games. I don't know. Well, I mean, they're just going to have to fall back on, you know, the the retail, you know, the physical retail market. If, if they're uh -huh. going to undercut Amazon. I mean, but France is a relatively small, small country. market and, and, in terms of the And I don't globe. even, yeah. yeah, I mean, Germany has a much, Nintendo has a much larger presence in Germany than they mm -hmm. do in France. So That makes sense, though, yeah. Um, but moving on, I think we're talking about what the Mario Kart VR, right? Yes, the Mario Kart Arcade GP VR experience will finally make its way to the United States after pretty much a year of test running in uh, in Japan. I think I believe they did a showcasing in. Oops, excuse me. I believe they did a showcasing in France uh, uh, at at some kind of con. So that's pretty cool. But we're finally getting it here, but only in Washington, D.C. So, yeah, anybody, anybody plan on taking a trip to D.C., 
might want to find a way to play this game. This totally sucks. Uh, there are so many places in this country that could accommodate Mario Kart VR experience, uh, Dave and Buster's being one of them. I know I love Dave and Buster's, and I and I'll, I'll always praise Dave and Buster's like for what they do. This is the this is the kind of thing that Dave and Buster's should have got on top of. I feel it, like it's not the, the, the Dave and Buster's that that they just built here in Tampa has a VR experience. They have a VR setup. Uh, right now, it's playing Jurassic World Two something or other. Um, they need to get their hands on this. This is dope. Like the whole the whole thing about this is dope, and I kind of feel like this VR experience is how they're kind of test testing their that Mario Kart ride that's allegedly coming to Universal Studios. It's kind of how I feel there. I think that this is like a test run. Um, I mean, so I think it's not too late for Dave and Buster's to try and implement this. I think. You know, we weren't even sure that Pokemon Tournament was going to come to the States at all. But Dave & Buster's oh, man, eventually got Pokemon. I think that we can get it in DC first. And after maybe, honestly, knowing Nintendo and stuff, after maybe a year or more, we might finally see this game roll out to, to other Dave & Buster's or some other place to accommodate it. Um, I think it's only a matter of time. I think something like this can... It's gonna blow up, and it's gonna make Nintendo enough money just in DC that they're gonna want to branch out with it. Yep, uh, they did say you know based on its success whether or not they will move the experience. Uh, I don't expect them to come here. They never bring anything good to Florida. Uh, you might have a better shot where you're at, man. Maybe if not, like the Michigan, Detroit area, probably Chicago is not a far drive, and Chicago gets a lot of those events like. Nintendo's what four like big sort of cities they hold events at like Chicago, uh, some place in California. I think it's L.A. Maybe there's two places, um, New York and I th- is Miami. it Miami? Yeah, yeah. They yeah. Do, when they come to Florida, they always do Miami, mm-hmm. and Miami isn't that close to Tampa. Let, I want, like that's no. a four hour drive. That is a mm-hmm. four hour drive. That's long. You know what four hours in a in a in a car is like in Florida. It doesn't matter how high you have the AC. It's hot. Hmm. I mean, at least right. driving through ice, though. That's my that's my argument back. Driving through ice is a lot worse. I would put up with the I've, heat. I've done that too. I grew up in Germany. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. So I want to do my own little news topic here. Actually, um, Meltan, um, who was sort of teased and just sort of dropped out of the blue into Pokemon Go. Um, you, there was a trailer shortly after. Has gotten a new trailer as of today. On Pokemon's YouTube channel, or, or YouTube channel, it's a very cute, cute, cute trailer. It has like this girl writing in her notebook about like observations about Meltan, and Meltan sort of just running around her house. But the the key big thing here I want to talk about is that they they at the very end they tease a sort of not an evolution, but I guess a, another form for Meltan, and that was a big tease. So any of you Pokemon, let's go Pikachu, let's go Eevee fans, or Pokemon in general, Pokemon Go. Look forward to that. That looks super cool. Meltan has me excited. And it was a great way to sort of introduce a Pokemon. Just sort of put them in Pokemon Go and just have the fans speculate, have a mystery uh, that they can solve as a community. And it spread slowly into, you know, the mainstream fan base. And it, it, it was a beautiful way to introduce a new Pokemon and draw a pipe for this game. And now that we have a new form, I think a lot of people who were sort of questioning Meltan are going to be a bit more open to this cute little guy or girl. Uh, you know, or I, I, thought, I, I, I don't know. This was a really weird rollout of a Pokemon for me. Uh, I don't dislike it though. It was weird, but I, I don't dislike it. I never, I never thought we'd see a Pokemon officially announced, you know, without an actual announcement. Yeah, they just mm-hmm. kind of released it, but they also released it on like a Pokemon Community Day event uh, mm-hmm. for like with the Chikorita. Yeah, the Chikorita event. So poor Chikorita. And mm-hmm. secondly, like I don't play Pokemon Go enough to have actively gone out to have caught one of these. Uh, I was intrigued by the news, and I do like that they've been like uploading these little episodes on YouTube featuring uh, ooh, Professor Oak and and Willow. Uh, Willow, yeah, Professor mm-hmm. Willow, 
And they're cute little videos. Uh, the Professor Willow looks really weird in those videos to me. Like he looks like there's like I some. Think- there's an Uncanny Valley thing going on there with Professor Willow that like freaks me out. If you guys don't know what Uncanny Valley means, it's like when something technological looks too human but not human enough. Like our brains perceive it as ugly. Mm-hmm. That's what Uncanny agree. Valley means. That's your education for today's show. Uh, but yeah, there's something really Uncanny Valley about Professor Willow in those videos. And Professor Oak looks like he's like last gen. 3ds graphics professor oak so it's actually kind of funny um, yeah no I, I like i think that's intentional detail where it's like they're cl- clearly two different universes you know one's in a mobile phone pokemon go universe and the other's in the 3ds universe i think that's supposed to be intentional it's, i don't know i thought it was cute i mean i like i said i like it and uh i like i like the way the new pokemon was rolled out uh but we still can't officially catch it yet uh until it we turns get this into ditto yeah, until we get this like mystery box item, then it will stay as a uh, Meltan. I guess this was the Pokemon that they were talking about that was going to be, you know, a new legendary that was exclusive. It's that was really weird though. Like the end. It's it's like a two month rollout before the actual launch of the game. I, I mean, it's pretty cool. No, I think uh, it's definitely pretty cool. I, I am I, a fan. So then next topic. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna stray away from Nintendo for just a bit. We're mm-hmm. gonna talk about Sony for a minute. Uh, for those people who don't know, Sony has had two handheld consoles. Uh, they had the PSP that was released back in two thousand four, and in two thousand eleven, right around the same time as the three DS launched, they and they launched the PlayStation Vita. Uh, as of next year, uh, I believe February of next year, they will no longer be making. Uh, PS Vitas, which means that Sony will no longer have a portable console on the market. Now, granted, it's not like the Vita got a whole crap ton of support after its first year, but I mean, the Vita is a relatively popular uh, niche niche system. Like, there's a cult following for the for the PlayStation Vita. I know a bunch of people who actually have Vitas, love their Vitas, and I know they're upset that Sony didn't, you know, spend a lot of time marketing and promoting and making games for this console uh, like they should have been to give it a long, strong life uh, cycle. Like, we're looking at the 3DS in 2018, and there's still some big games coming out. Luigi's Mansion uh, comes out on Friday. This Friday, Luigi's Mansion will drop for the 3DS. Now, Luigi's Mansion is not a new game, but it is a great IP, and I believe a whole bunch of people who you know weren't alive during the GameCube era will get a chance to play this game and fall in love with it the same way you know people from my generation did when they played it on the GameCube. So we're looking at, we, I mean, we look at the situations now. What is the biggest game to come out on the Vita this year? Like Vita still games? Wait, like, they still like games? <laughs> The, the the Vita is basically an indie machine right now, and and I don't say that to to dissuade people from you know the Vita. I don't say that to to knock the Vita. Like f- you could argue that the Switch has just as many independent games coming out on, on you know every you know day, week, month. But the difference is there are core titles coming out like. The way they launched the Nintendo Switch versus the way they launched the PlayStation Vita. Like, we launched with Breath of the Wild, then we had Mario Kart, then we had Street Fighter, then we had ARMS, then we had Splatoon, then we had Mario Rabbids, and Sonic Mania, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then 2017 was, like, the best console launch year ever. It was, like, every month was, like, a Christmas of its own because there was a major title. The Vita launched with an Uncharted game and nothing else on the flip side though sony did have a really successful handheld with the playstation portable the psp was a great little system uh i will say that there are a couple things that killed both systems like they pretty much left the system uh dead on arrival uh with the psp it was the the umds like the basically the games you know the the weird discs inside a case yeah, it was a weird CD combo thing. Uh, and the uh, Pro Memory Stick Duo, the basically... Uh, it's an the SD Sony, card. Yeah, it, yeah, it's their version of an SD card. It's the proprietary version of an SD card for Sony. 
those weren't expensive, but they weren't cheap either. That proprietary memory was killing that system. And it was mm -hmm. worse on the Vita because they didn't even stick to the same memory format. They moved to a new memory format when they switched mm -hmm. to the Vita. And that was even more expensive than the Pro Memory Stick Duo. And they don't have any kind of options for, you know, for, you know, a different type of memory stick. Mm -hmm. So that, that hurt. But then just the, the overall lack of games is what will ultimately kill a, any console. If mm -hmm. a console launches and they don't have any major titles, that's always going to derail the console, no matter how powerful, no matter how good, how pretty. Like Microsoft is having the same issue right now with the Xbox One. There are no exclusive titles for that system. Battletoads. Oh, come on now. We're getting Battletoads. Uh, no, no. You see, <laughs> but that, but that, with Battletoads, that's almost like that's desperation. That is a desperation. You don't tactic. know anything like, about Battletoads yet either. Like, like you just. <laughs> but it's happening. We're getting Battletoads eventually. Eventually, <laughs> yeah. On the Xbox, whatever comes next, box. Yeah, so yeah, like I feel bad because I think Sony is a is a good enough video game company that they can stand in the in you know they can stand toe to toe with Nintendo in the portable market. Like they did it, they did it. Like say what you want about you know the PSP, but it was a good system. The PSP was a really good system, and they there were enough iterations of the PSP to keep it going. Like they made improvements upon improvements upon improvements until they got to the PSP Go, which was an all-digital version, and that had its own issues. But not for nothing, still a very good iteration of the PSP. Uh, the support for that system, a little weird, but still. like The fact that you couldn't play like games like Final Fantasy Crisis Core on the PSP Go was weird, but still. There was a lot of support that I said. You know what killed it? I was talking to another friend of mine about this. Is it isn't it odd that in 2018 Square Enix announced Final Fantasy 7, 9, 10, 10 2, World of Final Fantasy, The World Ends With You, uh, and a bunch of you know Octopath Trevor. Would these games also not have been a perfect fit on the PlayStation Vita? Yes, yes, they would. Rhetorical question, I know, but I answer anyways. These are the games that Sony should have been pushing. I blame Sony for this. Sony had, like, when I think about Final Fantasy 7 and 8 and 10 and 10 2, I don't think Nintendo. Mm -mm. Because those games have never been on Nintendo. Because those have always been exclusive to Sony. And for the first time, that is not the case. And these games could have sustained the Vita for a while. Like, games like this, like, could have sustained the Vita and Sony didn't do what they needed to do to secure those titles. And now we're seeing them on the Nintendo Switch, which, for all intents and purposes, what the F, Sony? Why didn't you put this... This system was, like, in a coma from the day it was released, and they pulled the plug, and the damn thing just didn't die until, you know, obviously next year. I don't know. One thing that... I like to compare this to is Crash Bandicoot. Like when you got the remastered Insane Trilogy, you know, it was only on PlayStation at first and everyone loved it. They thought Crash, it's going to be on PlayStation if they, if they ever make a new one or a remake, or whatever. But now it's on the Switch. It's on every system now. And yeah, that's, that's another thing. That, those are two other games. I actually talked mm -hmm. about that with the same friend. Crash Bandicoot and, and Spyro. Spyro the Dragon are mm -hmm. not like exclusive to the Vita. Mm -mm. Dude, like seriously. Vita or PS4, yeah. They're they're coming to all their systems. And then, but I want to actually more lean this into Nintendo. But first of all, I'm one of those cult Vita players. Um, A bunch of my friends are actually too, which is kind of funny. We haven't bought any like new games because there just haven't been any. We've been playing it for like older games, etc. I was playing Disgaea 2 on it the other day and Persona. It's It's great. But it's there's nothing new on it. It's great for sort of older hits, especially now it's kind of cheaper. So that's what I like to use my Vita for. But I I believe it's the article we said, and just for reference, we are using the article um on oh you, you took it out Nintendo Live yep sure um and they they said that Sony's stepping out of the mobile 
portable hand like gaming device market in general. They're not making uh you know any new competitor or a successor to the Vita, which I think also one rules out the theories that people are having that the PlayStation 5 would be a Switch knockoff. I think they're gonna stick entirely home console. But it's interesting now that Nintendo has an entire sort of space to themselves. And that space is also shared by the Switch. So you have the 3DS sort of occupying the entire portable handheld gaming device uh, market with the Switch being able to be in both. And the only real competitor are mobile phones. There's no other real competitor other than phones right now. Um, <laughs> and I, I would flash back to the Engage just now. Oh, God. <laughs> But, uh, no, but you know what? Go ahead, go ahead. And, and I think it's really interesting to see how developers kind of shift to that in the future. Uh, if the 3DS continues these to be supported um, more than it is now and with stronger stuff, because um, I think they're trying to let 3DS die, but I'm just not sure anymore. But if they continue it and put more support into it, they can put a lot more into the 3DS now. That There's no competition. If developer wants to make a portable game that's better than phones, it's either going to go on the 3DS or the Switch. Um, I think developers have to go to the 3DS now. Technically, they could go to the Switch too. And I think that there's no other option to put your games on other than phone. And that kind of blows my mind. I wouldn't be surprised, though, if another company tried to get a piece of the mobile pie, though. Let's say... Sega finally makes another console, and it's a 3DS competitor. Or Microsoft makes a portable Xbox. That's a 3DS competitor. I I think it's possible. Maybe even Ubisoft, if we're really going to get crazy. But you know, I don't know. It leaves a it leaves a power vacuum, even though the Vita didn't have much power. I honestly think what could could save Sony and their chances in the handheld market would honestly be a strip down, if you take the core of the Vita and you take all the unnecessary stuff out of it and you make it a little bit more like the Switch in the sense how the Switch is purely a dedicated uh, console. It, like, it has Hulu. It has Hulu and that's it. Like, mm-hmm. It doesn't have Netflix. It doesn't have YouTube. It doesn't have you know, a web browser music. even. Yeah, it doesn't have music playing capabilities except for some Smash reason with Smash Bros. Ultimate. Uh, like... There isn't a whole lot of like, like extra stuff in the Switch. I think a more streamlined version of the Vita with a focus on first-party developed titles for the Vita or more titles that support really strong crossplay and maybe a better way to connect the system to a television would ultimately revitalize the console. But as it stands now, there are too many things in the Mm -hmm. Vita that don't get utilized. So I think a more stripped down budget version of the Vita would be more effective in today's market the same way that the Switch is. I think think one, streamline it like you're saying, but also make it more accessible to consumers where it's cheaper, but also those like memory sticks are more accessible because they are not accessible as we've already talked about. Um, They thankfully ditched UMDs which is a nice move just for the Vita itself. But um, definitely do what you can to make it more accessible to consumers on every budget, on every sort of like even the third-party accessory makers and and developers to make you know, third-party memory sticks, etc. I think allowing people to make things and buy things is a good thing Sony should do and have not done enough of. All right, but I think we've kind of run this topic into the ground just like mm-hmm. Sony ran the Vita into the ground. So it's time mm-hmm. to move on. We have one <laughs> we have one last uh, major news story, uh, and that is us uh, following. According to the Wall Street Journal, Nintendo plans on releasing a new version of the Nintendo Switch, and it's big news. That's big news. So we're, going, we're in the second year of the Nintendo Switch, moving into, you know, year three having a new iteration of the switch uh so what they want according to what they wrote in the wall street journal this new version of the nintendo switch will have a oled screen 
uh, something that's more in line with the new iPhones and the new Samsung Galaxy phones, which, you know, which means the screens will be brighter, but more efficient with their power, which means you could, you know, get a little bit more playtime in portable mode. On top of that, uh, it the capacitive touchscreen will be a lot more effective as well. Um, so all in all, if this does come out next year, I'm already going to, I'm going to call it, they're going to call it the new Nintendo Switch with the new moniker, the same way they have the new 3DS XL, the new 2DS XL, and the new 2DS. They're going to throw that new in there, and it's definitely going to be faster. It's going to have a better process, the processor, and I think it's going to be able to run, you know, the games that might struggle on the Switch a little bit. So games like Xenoblade Chronicles, uh, Wolfenstein, uh, Skyrim will all look a little bit better, or maybe a whole lot better, we don't know yet, on this new version of the Nintendo Switch hardware. I don't actually think the console is going to be any larger or smaller. I think that people are satisfied with the, you know, the overall, you know, dimensions of the Nintendo Switch. It is a very nice, you know, portable system that fits really nice in anyone's hands. So I don't think they're going to mess with their dimensions too much. But... Don't be surprised if this version of the Switch is a lot more, you know, battery efficient. And if that's true, isn't it nice that we finally have cloud saves if, you know, you know, if you subscribe you to Nintendo Switch Online. Yeah. So it's it's very if it, it, it kind of feels like it's in line with the fact that we have cloud saves now that they they may be releasing a new iteration of the hardware. Um personally I'm the guy that kind of upgrades his console, his 3DS every time they announce a new version of a 3DS, especially when they announce like XL versions of the system. Man, man could you imagine like an XL version of the Switch? The thing would be huge. It would be a I'm TV. Like, it'd be like the, it'd be like the the gamepad on the Wii U. Like it'd be huge. Mm-hmm. We can't go. Like I, I I honestly think that dimensions are are, are very key. On the Switch. Well, but, yeah, that too. But yeah, I mean, like this is like from the Wall Street Journal, so this is actually like a. It's a credible cr- source. Exactly. So this this, I am very much inclined to believe that we are getting a new iteration of the Nintendo Switch, just because if this was like from Kotaku, best believe I don't believe it. Mm-hmm. I don't believe it. You know, if this is from IGN, I take it with a grain of salt. But yeah, you might a bit, it. Ex- you know, you might, but like Wall Street mm-hmm. Journal, I the fact that they're it. reporting on it, yeah. Um, on, on that note, I I don't want to talk about this new Switch until we do get an official Nintendo says here's the new Nintendo Switch coming to 2019. Buy it; it's gonna cost 150 bucks, whatever extra than the current one, or the current one will go down. I don't want to talk about it until that happens. Um, I think a lot of people are feeling it's kind of too soon. I think that it's it is probably too soon. Uh, but I'm I I just the fact Wall Street Journal is reporting on it. Plus, there are like reports previously. I think I kind of do have to believe that it is happening. And maybe if not 2019, probably 2020. Um, it's a very Nintendo thing to do, as we've been saying before, where um. You you have like the Nintendo 3DS, Nintendo 3DS XL, new Nintendo 3DS, um, and I think it's we're going to see those iterations of the Switch at some point in the life cycle. Um, but I don't uh, want to say we just got a good point in the chat. Uh, somebody was saying uh, that they would like a dockless version of the Switch that's cheaper. That's been that rumor's been touted around for a while. I don't think Nintendo will go dockless, but Maybe a version that the Joy Cons aren't removable, in some way, shape, or form. It's weird. We don't know. I mean, I'm I'm interested to see what this new hardware is going to be like. I d- I know for a fact though, if Nintendo's releasing it, they're going to do the they're going to follow the same uh, rollout model of a 3DS, and be faster processor, maybe better internet access. That's the thing. That's the real kicker. The Switch's Wi Wi-Fi has always been kind of questionable. Uh, so. You know, with the 3DS, they've they always upgraded. You know, the Wi-Fi capabilities of the console. So I'd be more interested if it had, you know, 
you know, a better, better access to Wi-Fi. Um, because that's more important to me, especially like, you know, for the on the go gaming for games like, you know, Splatoon and Fortnite, I'm more interested in those, in those features. Uh, the OLED screen is nice, but honestly, I'm fairly satisfied with like the, the Switch's portable battery life. Like I think three hours is a fairly good amount of time to play a game like Breath of the Wild. You know, I know others will debate me on that, but yet and still, you're not I, playing Breath of the, you're not playing games like Breath of the Wild on the Vita or your mobile device. But the one last thing I think they might do if they make this system is I want to say they'll make some kind of gimmick, some sort of weird gimmick to add into the Switch that wasn't on the original. And I don't know what that gimmick might be, but it might be with an accessory. It might be with augmented reality like we saw with the 3DS or something. But I think it's going to be like a weird gimmicky kind of game in true Nintendo motion controls gimmicky fashion. Um, that would I don't know what it's going to be, but I think for sure a new iteration will have some kind of capability to allow that. Maybe even more stuff with the IR sensor on the Joy-Con that we only have really seen use with 1-2 Switch and Labo. I don't know. Yeah. So that's it for all of our news topics. I know this has been a very news-centric episode of the show, but I mean we've been gone for about three weeks, so I wanted to catch up on all the major news and like – <laughs> Honestly, it took us three weeks to get this many news stories in, you know, about. But yeah, uh, before we move on to our next topic, I just want to go ahead and shout out these sources for everything, uh, you know, as part of the commitment we made. So you guys always know who our sources are. So today we use the Wall Street Journal, we use Nintendo Wire, MyNintendoNews.com, Eurogamer, uh, The Rockfather. Um, uh, ComicBook.com, NintendoLife.com. And yeah, I want to thank all those uh, media outlets for writing really in-depth articles so that we could come on this show and we could analyze that news for you guys. So shout out to all those, you know, excellent, you know, news outlets. Uh, but for right now, I think we're going to take a, say, a five-minute break. And when we come back, we're just going to wrap the show up with what are we playing. So don't, guys, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Nintendo Power Zone, guys. If you're just joining us, we've just gone over the news and we're getting ready to wrap this show up. But we want to do an extended version of what are we playing because it's been a while since we've done a what are we playing. So really glad to bring this topic back to the Nintendo Power Zone. Uh, so, Brendan, why don't you uh, go ahead and kick off, kick us off with what we're, what you're playing? So I just want to start with like the list of what I've been playing, like, going down the line. Um, so one, a whole lot of Monster Hunter since August to now, just still playing the new Monster Hunter that came on Switch. Even though I've already played the Japanese version as well, it just never gets old. But beyond that, I've also gotten the new Nippo Nichi game, uh, Labyrinth of Refrain, Coven of Dusk. Which, for those of you who know Disgaea, they're the guys who make Disgaea. And for those of you who know Etrian Odyssey... Um, this game is like if Etrian Odyssey was made by the people who made 
actually not or made Disgaea, which is it's a dungeon crawler RPG where you sort of make the map as you go. Um, and it's really cool. I love the Action Odyssey series on the DS and 3DS. And it really, it really got me hungering for a new Etrian Odyssey. And I'll get into that when I talk more about that game. Um, and then beyond that, I just got Super Mario Party the day of. And I got a chance to play with my girlfriend as well as a group of friends already. And right after this episode, I'm going to play some more Super Mario Party with some group of friends at their house. Which will be a lot of fun. Um, we'll talk about that in a bit as well. And then lastly, I got... Disgaea, as you I mentioned before, um, I big Disgaea fan. I got the Labyrinth of Refrain, but they released a remake of Disgaea One, and I have with me the Rosen Queen Collector's Edition, and um, I want to sort of go through that real fast as well. Oh man, Whew, I have a big lot. list. <laughs> uh, I don't think my list is that long. My list is pretty long, so. I've been playing a lot of Fortnite on okay. the Switch and the PS4, uh, which is weird to play the game on two separate profiles. Uh, but still, yeah, I've been playing a lot of Fortnite. Uh, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm flat out terrible at Fortnite. Uh, I've had some really good matches, but I've had some like really terrible matches. And even worse, like I'll get to like second place with like zero kills. <laughs> and it's just so bad. Like I'm just terrible. At Fortnite, but uh, I'm trying. Uh, been playing a lot of Splatoon lately. Uh, just you know, trying out the uh, new Nintendo Switch Online features just to see how those are working. And I mean, they're all right. I mean, I haven't really noticed a significant difference in the game overall. Uh, but I still think it's actually you know, I think it's a slight improvement. Uh, but still, you know, I've been playing a lot of Splatoon. Uh, mostly just to, you know, ret retrieve my terrible ranks. Uh, but the game I've been playing a crap ton lately is Xenoblade 2 Torna the Golden Chronicles. Wow. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 Torna the Golden Country. That's what I meant to say. I beat that game in 25 hours. And it is really, really, really good. Really good. I was impressed that they were able to make that many changes to the battle system and, you know, take us back to like 500 years before the start of the main game and have it be that good. Um, granted, I don't think it's as good as the main game, but it's still like really good. Um, there are parts of the game that really set me off. Uh, there were two points in the game where I got progression locked, and I think that will happen to most people who play this DLC. They will be progression locked because this is literally the first game I've ever played where they lock progression to side quests. Oh. If you do not do side quests in this game, your story progression will be stopped. And oh. Monolith Soft, you guys have made an amazing, you know, game with Xenoblade Chronicles 2. And that progression locking, I almost put my hand through the TV mm. when I realized I had to do something like 44 que side quests oh, no. to get to beat this game. 44 side quests to beat this game. And the game isn't long. But the side quests can be really tedious. So ultimately, what you have to do is you have to do you have to build up your community. And in order to build up your community, you must do certain side quests. You must do side quests. And when you do a side quest, the people will join your community. There was one point in the game where one of the missions actually made me lose a community member. And at like five o'clock in the morning, I was like, <laughs> because that happened. I was oh, actually really, really PO'd when that happened. I was like, I cannot believe you locked me, and then you take away a character. Now, I got that character back by completing the entirety of the mission, but still, you can't play games like that, Monolith. That is unfair. <laughs> uh, aside from that, another game that almost made me put my hand through the TV was Mega Man 11. 
Mega Man 11 is unnecessarily brutal. <laughs> I have That's Mega Man. Beat... That's I, just no, Mega Man. <laughs> I've beaten Mega Man games before. This well, yeah. This game is brutal to a point. Like, I'm like thinking to myself, I can at the very least play Mega Man 11 on normal because I'm an experienced Mega Man player. Normal's too hard. So I was like, okay, well, <laughs> I, I'm going to take a hit to my pride and I'm going to play casual. All right. So I start playing casual. I was like, did the difficulty even change? Because damn, I'm dying more in casual mode. <laughs> so now I'm playing the game on newcomer, which is the easiest mode. And that is the only way I have beaten any bosses is by playing the game on newcomer, which is very infuriating and hurts my pride as not only a gamer, but as a Mega Man fan. So Capcom, bro, I think you guys need to <laughs> readjust the levels of difficulty in, in Mega Man games because this is unacceptable. This is damn hard. I was flipping shit when I kept dying. And I was like, I'm not even at the midway point of the stage, and I am dying a lot. Mega Man 11 is brutally hard. Uh, and last on my list, I've been playing Dragon Ball Fighter Z, which was the last birthday gift I got. Love it. Love it. Love it. It plays phenomenally on the Nintendo Switch. It looks beautiful. And yes. Now, it is hard to play with Joy-Cons. It is not meant to be played portably. Just not. The uh, the joysticks of the, uh, of the Joy-Cons are not good enough for fighting games. Uh, you need a pro controller or, you know... Whatever other type of like fight stick you want to use for that game, because it is impossible to play with Joy Cons, and and the Joy Con buttons are too small for it. They just they just are, so it doesn't feel natural, uh, which is a shame. I would like to play that game in portable. It just it's not optimal, not the best way to play Dragon Ball Fighter Z. That being said, Bandai Namco gets so many props mm -hmm. for bringing that game out on the Nintendo Switch and making it really fit on the console it it just works they did a phenomenal job of just making the game work which which says a lot because this game was released for the ps4 and the xbox one which are fundamentally much more powerful consoles than the nintendo switch and it and it looks beautiful it looks just as good in my opinion mm -hmm. so yeah those that's what i've been playing <laughs> Um, so I guess I'll start with the one everyone wants to hear about, which is Super Mario Party. Um, and the first thing I'll say is that it's a step in the right direction. It's not perfect. And for a good chunk of it, it's not bad. It's not good. It's just different. And I don't know how to feel about that. So, first of all, it's it's the first one made by ND Cube that I like. And for those of you who have been around a while, you know I like my Friendship Ender games. Friendship Enders are some of my favorite genres of video games in general. And I think this one does it pretty good. I think we've we've caught into a few fights, but had a good laugh at the end of the day. Um, there's only four main boards. There's two side modes. And then there's a mode I haven't gotten to try yet, which is like the best way I can really describe it is XCOM meets Mario Party. It's like a free movement tile-based system. And that's what I'm going to be trying out tonight um, after after this episode with my friends. And that's actually the mode I'm most excited for in this entire game. Um, so the main four boards, I believe, are Womps, Ruins, or Fortress, or whatever, um, bomb Om, like Mineshaft, and a Mega Fruit Paradise, and, and what, Kamix Castle? Kamix Castle, I guess. I, I don't remember the names off the top of my head, but um, Womps is is an okay starter map, and it's good. And then we have um, the bomb -omb map, which is essentially, I want to say, like, Waluigi's Island, which was a great map. It, it was an inferiority map, but it's almost like it's babies, Waluigi Island. A lot of things have kind of changed where they're... What, when you get blown up by the King Babom, you, you don't lose all your coins. You lose, like, half, I want to say. Which I think in Waluigi's Island, it was like all of them. So it's not too brutal of a course. Um, the economy has changed, where stars cost 10, stealing costs 30, coins are easy to get, and items are weird. There's They need to fix the balancing between, because the golden pipe item is broken. Getting a golden pipe is too good. 
um, there's an ally system now, and the ally system is interesting, where you can have like friends who roll slightly to increase your roll. And for those of you who don't know, in the new Mario Party, they have like spe- character specific dice blocks, where you have like you know you have your standard one through six die, which is not a one through ten anymore, but it's one through six. And there's a second one that is character specific, where you know we have some like Donkey Kong who has three zeros, um, a zero that gives you plus five coins, and two tens. <laughs> that's not a dice block. That's moving all or nothing or getting coins from time to time. And then you have things like Daisy, who's entirely fours and threes. Shy Guy is entirely fours and zeros. And some weird balances. Monty Mole is just the standard dice block, but instead of one, you get plus one coin, which why would you ever want that? And so there's officially a tier list in Mario Party now, and it's not good. (laughs) But you can, so if you're playing Mario, you get Luigi as an ally. You can use not only Mario's ally block, but Luigi's ally block as well. And Luigi will help you boost your role, which is a really interesting system. I actually like it a lot. If you're not a fan of that, you can always try and gentlemen say like, hey, use the standard one through six. If you get character specific dice, just don't use them. Which is totally fine if you're reasonable with your friends. Um, no friends my, are reasonable when playing Mario Party. Party. But that's There's that'd be the way to do it. See, I, I haven't bought Mario Party yet. I am waiting. Uh, my uh, my girl's in Georgia right now. She's spending time with family. So I'm waiting until she comes back so that I actually has somebody to play with. Um, no, yeah. Mario Party by yourself is not fun. And, you know, I was thinking about getting it, you know, because I got some birthday money. And, you know, obviously I used it on Fighters. But... Uh, I was thinking about getting it because I, I wanted to play, you know, with my brother and stuff too. But I was like, no, nah, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait till everybody's home, and then we'll all mm-hmm. play like while we're drunk and stupid and whatnot. <laughs> like we'll play it during like like a like a MMA card or something. Like the next UFC event, we'll probably sit down and play it before the pay per view starts. Uh, but I can't wait to get my hands on it because it you know it does look like a lot of fun. Uh, and I know a lot of people have been like super PO that it doesn't like have like online like boards. Like, it just has boards, mini yeah. games and not boards like, online. But it's just, I mean, I know pe- online Mario Party is just a good thing to have. That wasn't a it thing. Would, it would, I would love to see it, but I honestly hope that like if they do allow that kind of gameplay to happen, like they need to fundamentally fix the way Mario Party works online, like. It has to be mm-hmm. like maybe a shorter game. Yeah, you can't have an hour to two hour Mario Party games online. That's way too I long. I mean, I, I mean, I know I could, I physically could, mm-hmm. but, but you know, most people can. don't have that expendable time. Mm-hmm. No, uh, so I mean, so they would have to figure out a way to allow that. Uh, but mm-hmm. Honestly, I don't, I don't think I have anything else that I've been playing. Um, I mean, I'm still not done with Mario Party though, and I like the ally system a lot though. I think it's. Fun. I think ND Cube, the, one of the one things they did right with this was making the ally system and dice block system to sort of make the matches more intense is what it does, really. And I like that. Um, so we have tr- traditional boards back, and those are fine. We have dice blocks that are fun now. The items are okay, except for Golden Pipe, which is OP. Uh, the boards are okay. There's not a lot, and there's only 80 minigames, which, like, that's not that's thing to scoff at, but I kind of I would not mind actually paying money as long as it's not too much for more boards, more characters, and more mini games. I would want some old returning mini games. I don't care too much about new ones. Some new characters here and there, but at least one board. Like, give me a pack that has you know twenty mini games, a character or two, maybe even some guest characters like seeing Link or Isabel in Mario Party. Who wouldn't want that? Um, and like one new board, if I haven't already said that, and maybe a couple of those packs or two, I, I would be down. Like if you're listening to Nintendo, you have the ability to do so. That's cool. I might want them for free, honestly, but I would be willing to pay. I'm a Mario party enthusiast. I will do it if I really have to. Honestly, it's not like Nintendo couldn't just take the old ones, the, you know, the Splatoon rollout mm-hmm. of how they do DLC, uh, I've... and just, give us the stuff for free like just i mean four boards look i don't think that's you know too small Mm -hmm. but i honestly think they could probably get away with you know eight easy 
Yeah, I think the four boards isn't too small when you count in the other modes that are in the game. I think that's the real saving grace, is the other modes. I think 80 minigames, just the fact that there's not many returning ones is my biggest issue. Like, there's no bumper balls. How is there no bumper balls? <laughs> I don't know. That's a classic. Uh, that would be cool. That would be a nice DLC pack, is right? classic. The classic that's all games. I really want. I understand not having, like, old or i understand you know as money as 80 new ones i don't understand so little returning ones that's my big complaint is that none of them are returning i don't know but uh so then i'm gonna talk about the other modes there's two modes and then there's a couple other things here and there that i've unlocked so far i'm still unlocking stuff in this game mind you um is the uh sound stage which is by far my favorite mode in this game so far which I expected it to be my least favorite, in all honesty. So Soundstage is like Rhythm Heaven meets WarioWare in Mario Party. And it's great. I love it so much. It's little, like, 10-second minigames you play to the beat of a... Like, just play to the beat, replicate, like, the thing they put in f before you. Traditional minigame rhythm game stuff. And, you know, you start the, you start the game with all your party members fist pumping on stage and then whoever got the most successful rhythm game beats wins it's very quick very fun um i don't know i just really liked it it was a good fit for this game i'm glad it's in there i would not have tried it out otherwise um and then there's the boat mode like river raft survival where it's the it's the co-op mode it's just co-op which i we i think it's better than the cars you know, they did it right, making it, one, its own separate side thing. But two, you know, cars were, were only really bad because you're putting in the traditional Mario Party setting of being on a board. You know, when you're competing with each other, but working together and you're all rolling the same, it's weird. But when you take out that linear sort of board game format, I think it does a lot better. And you, you work as a team to navigate you raging rapids, taking different routes to your end goal, uh, collecting balloons, which give you mini games, which give you more time to complete the course. Um, and I, I don't know why it's just, it's just somehow a better fit for co-op in Mario party. I think it's not perfect, but it's definitely a step in the right direction in that regard. And one thing that is universal th throughout all modes is they make you high five or thumbs up your teammates. Which I I wasn't sure how I felt at first. At first, I felt it's kind of annoying. Like, why do I really have to sit through this like ten seconds of people coordinating their high five? <laughs> and it was really annoying at first. But I actually like it because it sort of in the co op mode it gives a sense of camaraderie. In the in the like main Mario Party mode, it gives like I don't know. It just gives a sense of it makes salty moments into laughable moments, which, you know, salty. I like being salty from time to time, but being <laughs> salty and angry and then having my friends kind of be like, Oh, what's wrong with him? is kind of like, I don't like that. Um, and so after, you know, I just had a humiliating loss in a team in the game or something, I get all get to high five and it's all good. We have a laugh about it and it, it makes things better in terms of it makes things more fun but i think it also saves friendships just a little bit too i don't know it's such a weird point. mechanic but i like it a lot i don't know like you have oh, to man. high five or such thumbs up they call it a thumbs up i call it a high five i don't know but you you shake your joy con which must be like this um and they all do a high five that's so know. weird but there's there's some mini games there's 80 mini games that are all new there's the four boards and two new modes. So you're getting a lot of good stuff that is is really a step in the right direction. A lot of things are just different. Like the character dice are different. Uh, the a lot of like minor things in the board are different. Like the ten star or ten coins per star is different. Uh, Bowser spaces aren't a thing. They're just unlocky spaces now. Uh, final five turns is now final three turns, and it's weird. But there's a lot of good in this game too. And it's definitely a step in the right direction. It's definitely worth it if you want a good Mario Party. If you're not too big a party game fan, maybe skip it. But if you want a good Mario Party, I'd say this is the best one in a long time. I'm still playing. Like I can't say how that XCOM mode feels right now, but 
And once I try that, I'll have an opinion I can relate back to. Um, <laughs> whew, I've been talking about Mario Party for a while. Um, and then <laughs> I, I want to talk about Labyrinth of Refrain, which is, like I said before, Etrian Odyssey meets Disgaea in a weird way. And I thought it would be a good way to sort of quench my thirst for an Etrian Odyssey game. But it scratches the itch, but makes me thirstier, if that makes sense. Like, it, it satisfies my gameplay needs, but it it's not the same. Etrian Odyssey just does it better, and I want Etrian Odyssey even more. Having, like, it's like I got half satisfied, and I want the rest. Um, <laughs> And so one of the big things, I think, is that the the way the story progresses and the characters sort of are it's a traditional sort of disgaea where you you buy your party members but they're sort of they're mute they're extras but you buy them they're fun little designs um so you have your man your sort of main, main character and um her apprentice luca i want i think her name is luca and they're the guys who progress the story but they are not your party members that you play the game as. I think that sort of disjoint really hurts it in terms of a gameplay and story narrative, where the camaraderie you feel between your party members interacting and clearing attention together as party members in Extreme Odyssey just isn't there. And it's it's bizarre. There's a lot of good things it does bring to the table in terms of gameplay, where um it's thankfully always on thing, which is I just have to go turn the mapping on in Action Odyssey. That was dumb. Um, the the powers that you can have, like breaking the walls, adds a whole new layer that I liked a lot. Um, but it just overall did not scratch that itch entirely. And that's upsetting. Um, monster, I love Monster Hunter. For those of you who don't know, you kill the monster, kill it a couple times, make new better gear using the monster's dead scales and parts and carcass, whatever, and you hunt an even bigger monster. It's great. Try it if you want. I recommend it. Um, but lastly is Disgaea 1 Complete. It's a remake of the first Disgaea game. Um, I have actually not played 1 ever. Uh, I know all about Laharl and the gang here in Disgaea 1. They're famous. They're in every single Disgaea game now. Um, and I'm excited to finally try it on the Switch. And it looks great. They've updated the visuals from what I've seen. And it's a fun, quirky, sort of zany game uh there's a lot of a lot of the mechanics are just fun in itself i think uh jaden had talked a bit on it in the last holiday special and he's like yeah it's great like the the moves can be up to like 999 damage and you can do like super insane leveling the combat system's one of the best strategy tactical rpgs i've seen in a combat like in those style games in ages and that's why i fell in love with the series um, for those of you who are part of the video se- uh, video podcast right now, uh, I will show you what's inside the box here. So this is, I'm not entirely sure, I think it's coaster set, called the Orthodox Prinny set. Uh, Prinnies, for those of you who don't know, are sort of like the Disgaea mascot. They're just like demon penguins that say dude a lot. Um, next, we got a flat mouse pad, which is sort of a fun <laughs> take on... These sort of booby support mouse pads you see a lot um, in Japan. There's also, I was surprised to see this. It's a Labyrinth of Re- Refrain comic book for the Labyrinth of Refrain um, game I was just talking about earlier. And that's been a kind of fun read. And there's, of course, a soundtrack, as you expect with any collector edition nowadays. There's always a soundtrack. There's an art book, which is small, but it's really high quality. Uh, showcase a little bit of this art book real fast. If I can. Hmm. So I'm really, I'm impressed with that so far. There's some poster sets I haven't opened yet. And then there is, uh, some enamel pins. And this is, there's multiple. So there's that side and that side. Um, so there's, I believe, nine pins in total. And there's also a little certificate of authenticity that you include as well. And it's it's been a really good collector's edition. It's there's also bundle. the box I've been what? It's like an amazing bundle. Oh, there's also a stuffed printy that I forgot to bring up. But there's also a stuffed printy. And then there's the box itself. It's pretty pretty cool. It's chest looking box. Um I can't buy I, more collector's edition. My girl's gonna kill me. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh yeah, no, I can't really afford it too many more, honestly. Um, but so I'm Just really happy. Sonic Mania, like the Sonic Mania collector's the edition. The plus one, yeah. No, the uh, big one, the big one with the statue. Oh, that one, yeah, the Sega Genesis Sonic statue. <laughs> oh man. But overall, I'm really impressed with the haul here. I haven't tried Disgaea 1 yet. It just came in last night, but I'm super excited to play it. Um, and that's what I've been playing and will be playing, as well as a little bit into Starlink Battle for Atlas's lifespan. I plan to get that game. Yeah, after this, I'm definitely going to go pick up Dragon Ball Fighters because, yeah, been, that game is just fantastic. Uh, but guys, before we let you go, I want to remind everyone that this Friday... All you Nintendo Switch owners, Luigi's Mansion for your 3DS, but for the Switch owners, The World Ends With You Remix. If you have not played The World Ends With You, this is your chance. I don't know if this is going to be the definitive version of the game. I It's hard because that game's like only out on the DS and the like iPad. And iPad. It's not even on other you know mobile devices, exclusive to iPad for some reason. But that was a phenomenal game. And made by Tetsuya Nomura, the same guy who who makes Kingdom Hearts, who's worked on the best Final Fantasy games, not 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 15. Well, well, technically he did work on 15, but he was kicked off of 15. And whatever, yeah, <laughs> whatever. Forget forget 15. But all the really good Final Fantasy games, Tetsuya Nomura was a part of them, and Kingdom Hearts, which those games are phenomenal. This game shares an art style with Kingdom Hearts. So it is visually appealing, but it's done in a sprite format. So yeah, it's a fantastic game. If you haven't played it, I implore you, play this game. It's worth your time, especially if you're a PlayStation owner and you're gearing up for Kingdom Hearts 3. This is a nice, you know, little break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's better to play this game than playing any one of the extraneous other Kingdom Hearts games. Dream <laughs> Drop Distance, for that matter, has the oh. little bunch of characters in it. But if it you does. want to go through that slog as well, be my guest. I won't force you, though. I mean, they did just release that in the 2.8 version of Kingdom Hearts. Oh, they PS4. did. They did. Okay. Uh, so it's right. all in HD and whatnot. Not that we're you know, advocating for you to go out and play you know, Sony. We're a Nintendo podcast. But still, yeah. Play what you want, game. man. You know, a good game is a good game is a good game. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Luigi's Mansion for the Nintendo 3DS. Uh, the world ends with you on the Nintendo Switch, both dropping this Friday. If you have to pick one, damn, that's a hard. If if it's a choice, those are two really good games. If you I have guess. played one but not the other, I would go for the one you haven't played personally. Because a lot of you have not played um the world ends with you. A lot of people haven't played Luigi's Mansion. But if you haven't played one, I'd say just go for the other. Yeah, uh, personally, uh, these are both games that I want to pick up because. They are fantastic games. They just, there's just no no other way about it. They are fantastic games. Uh, but yeah, that's gonna be it from us guys. Uh, but before we let you go, we gotta hit you up with these social media links. You can hit me up on Twitter at nice1983. You can email me at nice1983 at gl.com. You can hit me up on Facebook, facebook.com slash the Nintendo Power Zone. And if you're a fan of this podcast, you can always download new episodes on iTunes, Google Play Music, stream new episodes on Stitcher Radio. But if you wanna watch the show live like you're doing right now, you can catch us right here on YouTube, youtube.com slash Nintendo Power Zone. If you like this content, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe so that you stay up to date with all the new content that we bring you. B, social media links. Uh, yeah, so you can find me at the King Blues on Twitter as well as Twitch TV and YouTube at the King Blues as well. Uh, blues, as always, spelled B L O O Z. Uh, and yeah. All right, guys, take it easy. Peace. <laughs>